before you today with hearts open to receive your word and to be nourished by your spirit. As we reflect on the words of Jesus in our gospel today, we are reminded that he is the bread of life, the true sustenance that satisfies our deepest desires. But Lord, we acknowledge that we often seek fulfillment in things that cannot satisfy us. Help us to turn our hearts towards Jesus who offers us the bread that endures eternally. Lord, we struggle with doubt at times. Just as the people did when they questioned Jesus, we pray for faith that surpasses understanding. A faith that allows us to see Jesus as the living bread that came down from heaven. Help us to trust in his promises that whoever comes to him will never be hungry. And whoever believes in him will never be thirsty again. Father, we bring before you the needs of our community and our world. We pray for those who are physically hungry and thirsty, that they may be provided with the resources they need. We pray for those who are spiritually hungry and thirsty, that they may encounter Jesus and find the true satisfaction that is in him. Use us as your instruments of grace in this world. May we be and share the bread of life to those who are around us. Draw us nearer to you, O Lord, so we can be reminded of the unity we have in Christ. Help us to live out this unity in our daily lives, showing the love and grace to one another. We ask for your blessings upon this church as we seek to grow in our understanding of your call and commitment to your mission. So in the spirit of unity and with hearts full of gratitude, we join together in the prayer that Christ taught us. <coughs> Lifting our voice as one family in Christ, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive from those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, for the first reading of the morning, I would like to invite up Zara. Zara! Yay! <laughs> Just me, sorry. <laughs> Not nearly as fun. Good morning, all. The scripture this morning is from Luke 6, 31 through 36. And again, I forgot my readers, so forgive me when I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid to full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father in heaven is merciful. The word of God to the people. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Lord. Right. That's beautiful. Okay, the word of God this morning is found in John chapter 6, verse 35 and 41 through 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. <coughs> he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one day, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am living. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. So as we explore through John chapter 6, we find the bread of life is a constant theme, right? As Jana told the children, bread, 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 what does it all mean? Well, Jesus is now going to give us another discourse and a, and a different way to view the bread. And in our gospel lesson, Jesus begins his statement this morning with these words. I am. And he says, I am the bread of life. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know it, this is a clue, right? This is the same clue that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when he said, I am who I am. It was the message that Jesus used for the defense, right, for his defense against the religionists of his day. When he said, before Abraham was born, I am. It is the same message that Paul proclaims to the Colossians. When he said, he is the image of the invisible God. The first born over all creation, for by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And this is the very same message proclaimed in John by, in the book of Revelations when he says Jesus is he who is and who was and who is to come. <coughs> yes, Christians, we have only one God. And that one God came into this world and became one of us. God came in the form of a human being to give life to those who believe. Do you believe? Do you believe in real life? All right? We all have our own lifestyles, but we all get that same choice. We can merely exist, or we can truly, truly live. Live a full life. However, this choice can only happen because of the choice of Jesus Christ to die on our behalf. So the question I want to start with this morning for you all is, are you just going through the motions? of this life? Because there are so many of us that are. And this going through the motions leaves us wanting. 
One of my very best friends in this world has lived his life this way. Just going through the, the motions, right? He went through the emotions in, or the, the motions in high school just to get by. Now he's going through the motions of life in that same way. He gets up, goes to work, comes home tired, goes to bed, gets up, and does it all again the next day, right? Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Over and over again. There is no fulfillment in this type of living. There's very little joy in that type of living. And a few years ago, this same friend said to me, he said, you know, Mark, if I would have known that the best years of my life would have been spent in high school, I think I would have made more of those years. But I knew him in high school. He was miserable then, and he still seems miserable today because he's merely existing, right? Rather than truly living. And what is it all for? Simply just to endure, to get through it, and get out, right? And, if he, and he's a Christian, right? So what is the idea behind that? Go through life. Try not to sin more than you do good so you get accepted into heaven in the end. Is that the purpose? What kind of life is that to lead? Just to get by and barely escape. Right? Why would God create beings like that? That to me makes no sense. So what is the goal then? Right? What is our end goal in living this life? Is it simply to upgrade our things, right? To get a better cell phone? To live in a bigger house or to drive the newest car or truck? That's how the average person in this world lives. But, could we call this living? Is this living? Or is this what real death looks like? It is a slow and gradual demise. In reality, what this is, is nothing less than hell. Hell on earth. And there are people who choose to live this way. By their choices. As a matter of fact, most people in this world live this way, even us Christians. Now, of course, Jesus is offering a wonderful alternative, right? In verse 35, Jesus declares, I, have, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. So are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you getting what you want out of this life? Do you want more from this life? Because Jesus offers more. You see, the symbolism that Jesus uses here to describe himself says just as life gives us physical sustenance, or just as bread gives us physical sustenance, right? It can sustain our life. Jesus gives us spiritual life. Bread feeds our bodies and is essential for sustaining us. But Jesus gives us sustenance for our souls, which is a radical new way of living. It is a radical new relationship between us and God. Without Jesus, real life, which is much more than just existing, is not possible. But many of us are just going through the motions of this life. And those people usually are aware of that. They know that they're just existing. I tell my friend that all the time. I was very aware that I was just existing. And therefore, I had a hunger. And they have a hunger for some kind of real existence, for something more from this life. 
Humanity was created for a reason. You are a Christian for a reason. But when we ignore the offer from Christ, like many people do, we look for meaning and are lost. Therefore, we make gods out of things we shouldn't, right? Like athletes, or movie stars, or politicians, or the rich and powerful, right? They become our gods. And then we try to become like them. But these people go to great lengths to acquire the lifestyles they do. They have to sacrifice a lot. And of course, in this life, there's only so much someone can eat, <coughs> right? You can only live in a house that is so big. And you can only drive one car at a time. <laughs> but as people try to imitate these false gods, they find this too. Right? It's not very satisfactory. Have you ever wanted something so much and drill, drove yourself to get there only to find out it wasn't all it was built up to be? It's not as satisfying once we get it as it was before we had it. So we give in to temptations, right? Try to cut corners or cheat, right? Cheat on our partners, which leads to what? Mistrust and problems and resentment. And even on occasion, it can lead to murder or suicide. People put a lot of effort and work very hard to live this kind of life. Bringing themselves under a cloud of debt, which causes what? More anxiety, more worry, and even more problems. Because now you need to take the next step. You have to protect the things you just gained. Your possessions now need to be protected. And now you have to fight to keep all that you have. And it's the same for people who are trying to constantly stay young looking. Right? Spending great amount of time and energy and money on the latest diets or fashion fads or even plastic surgery. But the problem with this is eventually time is going to win. No matter who you are and no matter how much money you possess, time is going to win. Aurora and I have a friend who is in her mid to late 40s and is doing all she can to stay looking young. And we recently spent some time with her and we came to the realization that she's not very comfortable in her own skin, right? Or with herself. She recently had surgery. And even though she, she's satisfied with the results of it, she is not satisfied herself. Because that evening she says, I wish I was younger. And I looked at Aurora, and she looked back at me, and we heard her say, oh, man, I wish I could be 25 again, or even 35 again. But my immediate response to that was, not me. I never want to be that age again. Does anybody remember how miserable, right? The emotions overtaking your body, the anger, the, the joy, everything is just so up and down. I sure wouldn't want to be 25 again. I have never been so happy in all my life than I am right now speaking in front of you. And my family and I do not have a lot of money. But we do have something that is much more valuable to us. And to me, it's one of the most valuable things in all of creation. We have life, real life, a life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is who we seek to serve. This is who we try hard to be like. 
This is our one and only God. And to be honest with you, this probably causes us to look poor in the eyes of most people. But in reality, we are so rich, so wealthy. We live such abundant lives with love and joy. Beyond our wildest dreams, we pray all the time about how we don't deserve how much love we receive. But people with, who do not have a relationship with God could never understand this concept. I know I think to myself all the time, what reasonable, be reasonable beings can bring themselves to miss out on so much and for so little? Right? Every one of us have been offered the bread of life. And some of us still prefer to starve to death. Why do you think that is? When Jesus tells us, all that the Father gives me, <clears throat> for those who come to me, and whoever come to me, I will never drive away. Do you understand that you can gain everything by pursuing God? And God says and does these things because Christ regards us as a wonderful gift. A gift to him from God the Father. Think about that for a moment. Let's take a moment to appreciate this. Jesus thinks of you as a prized possession. What an awesome God we have. We speak of Christ as God's unspeakable gift to us, right? All the time. That's what worship is. We speak of Christ as something that breaks through the language barrier and yet still can't be described as a last and crowning proof of God's divine grace to us. But Jesus regards us and the saving of us from our own nature, not as a frustrating endeavor, right? Not as an impossible joy, chore, but a gift. A gift to be prized and treasured. I thank God every day for that. But still, notice many people resist this incredible reality. In verse 44, it said, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them in. You should all know that it is God's will that no person should expire, but that all will come to accept the saving grace of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis said it best when he said, You will never look into the eyes of someone who God does not love. So this God of love draws you in, calling to you, to each of us, right? Calling us to Christ. This verb here draws in verse 44. It imposes or it implies that we have some resistance to the calling. So you should know you can and others do develop a resistance to this call. We can have great resistance to this draw. As many of us do, in fact, reject Christ's offers, or ignore it, or try to put it off right until some better time in our life. But as we go through the motions of life, we try and look for meaning everywhere, for an existence that is only going to happen through our own pride. And know that God gives us that choice. We all have free will. I say it again and again in this pulpit. But God did not create a bunch of computers to be programmed. But at times, this can be a double-edged sword. Because God is constantly calling Right now, God of the universe, the creator of all things, is calling to you in this moment. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? Is your resistance turned up? 
so that you can overcome this call. There are many times in my life I want to resist the call over and over again because it isn't convenient. But it is our resistance that can overcome God's call. We can choose to reject God in our lives. We can choose hell over heaven, death over life. And in making this choice is like refusing bread when you're starving. But when we do that, we are refusing the very essence that gives us our life. Jesus is the kingdom of God. And he wants us to have heaven. Did you know that? Jesus wants you to have heaven right now. Today. And Jesus tells us that I am the bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give to you for the life of the world. So we must feed on Christ. Feed on him. There is no other way better to express it. Right? We must absorb Christ. We must absorb Christ's teaching, his character, his virtue, and his words. All that is in him until his mind becomes our mind and his ways become our ways. Until we think as he would if he were here in our place. Until his power becomes our power. Paul says it best when he says, I have learned the secret to being content, content in, every, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So have you learned the secret to happiness yet? I'm preaching it from this pulpit. It is a secret that everyone in the world knows, but few accept. Have you learned the secret to happiness? We can be joyful in any and every situation. <clears throat> Only if you have a steady diet of bread, the bread of life. Having removed your resistance to God's drawing us to Christ, Here's something we have to do. When we've had the bread of life, when we have feasted on the spirit of Jesus, whenever possible, however possible, we must pass the bread. Pass the bread. There is plenty enough to go around. You can eat your fill, and there will be some left over for all. Ask Jesus. We see the spirit feeding of the 5,000, we think, wow, how did they start off with more, or start off with, how did they end with more after starting with so little? That is the bread of life. This bread is to be shared by all and for all, with everyone who will take it. And in sharing this bread, we learn the true value of the bread. This, my friends, is what it means to live a real full life. And you can have it today if you would just take a piece of this bread. Take it home with you. Feed on it. Absorb it. Bring it into your soul and you can have heaven today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now would you please rise in body or spirit as we sing the next hymn of the morning. Grace greater than all our sin. Verses 1 through 4. What time? I'm sorry. 1 and 4. Oh, 1 and 4. I'm sorry. <laughs>
gifts today, let us reflect on the many blessings we have received from God's hand. Our offerings are an expression of our gratitude, a response to the grace we have experienced, and a commitment to support the work of his kingdom. Just as Jesus gave himself fully for us, we are called to give joyfully, knowing that our contributions make a difference in the lives of others and in the ministry of our church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings you have poured into our lives. As we bring our offerings to you, we ask that you bless and multiply them for the work of your kingdom. May these gifts be used to spread the message of Jesus, the bread of life, and to provide for the needs of our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, are there any ministry opportunities that need to be brought to our attention? I always have some, so if nobody else does. Okay, it's your turn. Okay, my turn. <laughs> Uh, we can still use another liturgist. Uh, Diana Stromquist was a liturgist in back in the past. And we could use another person in the rotation. Um, also, we have discussed that we do need a funeral coordinator. Now, we do not know what that position is going to look like. But if you have that call in your life and would like to help a family after a, a, a death, this would be a very good calling for you. It is a very, very loving commitment, and so we ask that that person be willing to um, just open themselves up to whatever that, that position may, may be. But we do find that we need a coordinator of memorials, for sure. Are there any others? Please rise in body or spirit as we sing the final hymn of the morning. Father, I am for you.